Well, hello everyone. It's that Weems guy here for finally another show. Uh, I apologize for the couple of weeks break. Uh, I had the second uh, eye surgery and that went well, although apparently I appear, appeared tense on the operating table. So they decided to give me a second shot of the happy juice. And so I took a little longer coming out of this one than I did the previous one, uh, but everything went well as far as the procedure goes. I am having some adjustment issues. Um, first and foremost is sometimes I can see the edges of the artificial lenses that have been implanted and that becomes very disorienting. Um, the doctors say that, that will go away in time. The other issue that I'm having is that I'm having trouble adjusting on like fine items like tightening up the screw when I'm attaching a new pistol mounted optic to a pistol focusing in and that issue is not going to resolve itself that's going to have to require uh the intervention of eyeglasses so two eye surgeries and now i get to wear glasses so yay uh, but other than that recovering fine from the procedure and everything went well the world no longer has a big gray haze over it and i don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing uh i do, am enjoying uh being able to drive at night again that's nice um the other thing is I was gone for a week to a training class and just did not have internet access to the level that I would need to do an episode. And speaking of which, we've already frozen up once as we were uh, as we were getting ready to do this episode. I do live in an area that was heavily impacted by the hurricane. I was basically unscathed, uh, but I did lose power for a little while. But I've got nothing to complain about compared to what's going on around me. Uh, but cell service, internet stuff is being impacted, as are grocery stores and gas stations, which is a fun topic. Um, but enough of that. Here to play along tonight is Eric Galehouse. How are you doing, Eric? Good, Lee. How are you? Well, I know how you are. We've just heard. I'm doing fine. Let me take my drink since I said your name. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last week in class that if my name was said too many times that people would turn, yep, to the beverages. <laughs> That's a drinking game, supposedly, although I am drinking water. Mm. All right. So what we did tonight is we have a solicited questions in the show group uh, to ask Eric. And the first question actually was suggested several weeks ago by Carl Wren. And basically what Carl has noticed is a trend in the gamer side community that is kind of creeping over into the application side is people thinking it's acceptable to manipulate the safety on a 1911 style. We're just going to say 1911 for all of the 11s, uh, any single action auto that has a manual safety. Um, saying it's susceptible to manipulate the 1911 manual safety while the pistol's still in the holster and like before it's even been presented to the target because it is, quote, faster. Eric, uh, give it over to you. So this, this has been a topic for a while. I, I think the first time I came across it was a GM pushing it probably about a year and a half, two years ago. Um, I carried a 1911 for... 21 years of my 29 in the business, right? So that was a duty gun. It was a teaching gun. It was a training gun. The way I was taught, the way organizations that carried 1911s at that time taught it were that the weapon stayed on safe until the decision to shoot had been made and the muzzle was coming on target. So if you drew to a low ready, the pistol stayed on, the thumb safety stayed on, the th thumb of the shooting hands riding that thumb safety right until the decision is made to shoot and you're coming up on target if you're drawing from the holster to the shot the thumb safety stays on until the muzzle rotates forward currently um, at gun sight the way that the terminology is rotate it used to be click and that click was count three of the, the presentation and that's as the muzzle rotated onto the target the thumb safety was taken off right Otherwise, if it's in the hand for anything other than shooting, it stays, thumb safety stays on. And that's my take on it. It may not necessarily be technically faster, um, but it serves its function in that role. It doesn't take time to take it off when coming from the low ready up or coming from a compressed high ready onto the target. When you're moving through a structure where you may have a whole bunch of decision making to do, it doesn't hurt 
doesn't have an adverse impact. Pat McNamara, uh, retired sergeant major out of the Army Special Mission Unit, has talked for years about using the mechanical safeties on carbines and on the handguns. And Pat's line is that it's not a disabler. Right? It's an enabler. It's not a disabler. I'm a fan of mechanical safeties. When I moved away from a 1911 app to be to an MMP with a thumb safety on it, I've got 2011s, a couple different ones. I don't see the need to change how we run the thumb safeties. Do you think that the current methodology or the people advocating the methodology is just as soon as you grab the gun, whack the safety? Is that coming from people who grew up in a striker fire world that did not live through like the the first era of the nineteen eleven pattern gun, and now they're like not understanding why we did that way, things that way. Seeing some of the other things that I'm seeing with the, like the twenty elevens these days, it would not surprise me if that's the foundational reason behind it. Right, we had twenty thirty years of Glocks, where for probably the first ten fifteen of those, the nineteen eleven was going out of out of fashion. Even entities that traditionally used the nineteen eleven moved away from, from it to Glocks about 20, 25 years ago. The, the case is the place I'm thinking of. So there is, there's a loss of procedural memory, institutional memory on how that was run. Um, there's a much greater emphasis now on speed and perceived speed at tenths of second, hundreds of seconds. Um, and that's something that can be in theory measured versus decision-making which is hard to measure in a video um, with a timer. Uh, I personally subscribe to the notion of muzzle on target, safety off, muzzle off target, safety off. Yes. If, if, if there was one thing I could adjust at, at one place I teach, it would be that once we come off of the target, the safety goes back on. But the consensus is that we do not put the safety back on until the assessment phase has been completed. It's not my preference. I can live with it, right? But I, like you, Lee, if my muzzle's coming on target, that's when the safety comes off. When my muzzle is leaving meat, leaving the target, it goes back on safe. Uh, that's the way I run an AR. That's the way I teach the AR. Uh, I don't have near the experience with the 1911 platform that you have in my brief foray into it that's the way I ran a 1911 and that's what I advocate because at the end of my career the sheriff's office we had several guys that were buying into the staccato thing and so that's what I was advocating for them uh, if they were going to use the staccato on duty and it's why would you not use the safety we would we would look askance at somebody who didn't use it on an m4 we would look askance at people who don't use them on on the shotgun um, there's been reams probably forests of paper killed talking about the use of the safety on the mp5 and how that has been modified over the years to get it to where it could be used in the same way um, I mean, i've got i've got a prodigy here it's cleared out it's empty it is taking no time to work that thumb safety All right so yeah i don't get it now let, let's take this, the 1911 platform safety question to another level. Uh, I know you were involved in a discussion several months back, maybe a year or so ago, uh, where people were taking a rubber band and, and basically disabling the grip safety. What are your thoughts on that? I'm opposed to the idea of disabling the grip safety unless you're just going to take it to a gunsmith and have it pinned. Right? If, you're, if you're going to go that far with it, take it and have it pinned. Otherwise, I can see an argument being made um, either way, especially in the event of something that you didn't intend to have happen happen with a tape down grip safety um, or one that's held down with a rubber band. We've gone through several iterations of grip safeties and thumb safety combos, but most all the current pistols are running a memory groove or a bump on the bottom of the beaver tail to aid in taking it off when you establish your grip, especially if you're wearing gloves or you're running high thumbs. Um, there were efforts made in the past to go to low mount thumb safeties for various reasons, but the current combo of a traditional or almost high mount thumb safety, a cut up beaver tail, and then having that memory groove or that bump on the back of the grip safety, right, seems to have done away with most of that. And while I don't have large hands, 
I, I haven't had a problem in a couple of decades of being able to hit the bump on the back of the grip safety, establish a grip and run both the grip safety and the thumb safety on the pistol. Uh, am I correct in my understanding that the reason the grip safety is in the 1911 pattern is that the cavalry required it and John Moses Browning added it to the design? That is my recollection is that the cavalry wanted it. Okay. Now, the whole purpose of that was in the event that if they dropped the 1911. Yes. And if my understanding is correct, a number of cavalry troopers were killed each year when they would drop basically their cock single action army, it would discharge injuring and killing troopers. And so for that, they insisted that there'd be a grip safety in their 1911s. That part sounds familiar, but my recollection is that the cavalry branch wanted it. Right. And you can, and if you don't like it, if it doesn't work, Novak has made the answer, which is just a giant one piece backstrap that houses the mainspring and gives you all the way up to the beaver tail without having the grip safety. You can have it pinned. You can have it desensitized to make it, make it easier to take off. Um, if we have gunsmiths who will not disable the magazine safety on a Browning high power, why would we have folks taping down a back uh, the grip safety on a 1911. I will confess that in my brief foray into 1911s, I had a Springfield, uh, which a model that predates the loaded, mm -hmm. whatever that would have been called, that I never had any problems manipulating the grip safety. The gun always worked. But then my agency at the time had some uh, old Kimbers, and I would have problems with it from time to time. And I wanted to have a different thumb safety put on my 1911. And I take it to the local gunsmith and he takes my gun apart and he goes, do you know that your grip safety has been disabled? What? <laughs> well, no wonder I never had a problem uh, manipulating the grip safety on this pistol. Would you put a, uh, a new grip safety on here for me as well? And lo and behold, then I started having issues manipulating the grip safety with the gun. It's one of the reasons I gave up the platform. Yeah, I uh, get it. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there was just something in my grip or whatever that I wasn't 100% of the time uh, disabling the grip safety. You know what? I didn't have that problem with the clock. Mm -hmm. And so I just carry clocks for the most part. There was... One of the various websites out there was re recently sent out an email um, trashing the idea of a mechanical safety on a, on a fire, on a handgun. You've got them on our carbines. With the exception of a Glock and the M2 Browning heavy machine gun, every weapon I have been issued, well, and a revolver, every weapon I have been issued or carried on duty had some sort of mechanical safety on it. Beretta M9, Beretta 92F, right? 1911s. Mm -hmm. um, the MMP, right? The Glocks don't have it, but, you know, M60, M4, M20. Well, the M203's got one, right? The M240 has them. Just, it's not an issue to use it if you train with it. Yeah, I don't see the issue with them. Now, provided they're in the right location and, mm -hmm. and they function properly. Um I did carry a Smith and Wesson 4006 when I first came. And you job. froze. And we carried it with the safety off. We carried it in the firing position, but it was frame mounted and the gun was designed to be carried that way. Uh, you, you you froze for me, so I missed part of that. Okay. The uh, I did carry a Smith and Wesson 4006 when I first first went on, on the job. But that was a gun that was designed to be carried without having the manual safety engaged. It was a quote decocker slash manual safety. And you carry the gun double action, fired the first shot double action, everything after that subsequent was single action until you manipulated the decocker slash safety lever to drop the hammer. And then anytime we would do any administrative handling of the gun, we would you know, hit the safety lever down. But you couldn't even snap it into the holster if the safety lever was to the safe position. It had to be in the fire position or our duty officers wouldn't accept it um, just for the way they were molded. I would have hated to have had to carry that with the safety lever engaged because the, the manipulations required to have flipped that safety off, drawing it from the holster. Now that would have been problematic because yeah, it's just that, not intuitive. 
that and the Breda, while they're not they're not wonderfully long and they're difficult to hit, you can get the thumb to work to do it. Yeah. Um, at least one of the two very large West Coast agencies, one of the three large West Coast agencies using systems like that for decades, taught sweeping the decock lever, the thumb safety, earlier the thumb safety, later the decock lever forward on the presentation. And that was part of the post loading sequence too, was to sweep it to ensure it came back into the off or the fire position. Yeah. All right. So anything else you want to say about the safeties? No, just you, you're going to have to train with them. If you're going to have them, you're going to have to train with them um, so that they aren't in that air quotes category of kilt in the streets. Right? Um, I don't think they're a disabler. I haven't had issues with using them on any of the platforms I've had them on. All right, so we'll move on to our next topic. Uh, this was suggested in the show, show group. Uh, what are the challenges that you see uh, we'll say an agency wants to adopt pistol mounted optics, which we'll is called PMO from here on out. What are you seeing as far as like getting instructor staff put up to up to speed, adoption, selection, it's everything. So I I'm kind of in a fortunate position. I taught <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> I'm in a fortunate position. I recently had a chance to run an instructor development course for an agency that has since transitioned their whole sworn staff into pistol mounted optics. And I was talking to them along the way because I, I work with the captain from that agency at, at another organization. They had looked at them. They had been looking at them for a while. They made a decision on transitioning to a base handgun that would accept the, the optic they wanted. And they made a decision on the optics. So they, they chose the pistol, the optic, they had them together. Along the way, they got buy-in up and down the chain of command. So they had ones available to test. The captain was driving the project, but the chief was receptive to it. The chief, had, they'd gotten the chief out to the range and the admin staff out there to where everybody had a chance to see this. They'd gotten buy-in from the instructors. They brought, it, they brought me in to teach an instructor development class for their staff and people from a couple other agencies. And I was teaching with the same platform they were adopting to. Um, which might have might have helped it for them. They took a look at the recommendation on to how to conduct the transition training, not just here's the gun, go to the range and shoot, but that it involved both classroom time, multiple sessions on the range, so that they could retain the information, come back, revisit it, and expand on it. They did the transition. I was talking to their captain last night, and the last time they ran agency calls out of a 250. 250 points, they were 227 out of, now that they've gotten everybody through the transition to the pistol mounted optics with a new handgun, they were 243 out of 250. So they had a 16 point increase in their average qualification score. Their worst shooter in the transition was five points higher than their old organizational average. They had the buy in and they worked through the process and there were, there were admin issues that some of us wouldn't necessarily think about like, okay, how much is it going to cost? How do we budget for replacements down the road? How do we do some of these other things? And then they looked at not only handgun for uniform officers, but handgun and optic for uh, the, the investigative staff, the admin staff, right? And they just went with a compact version of the pistol, but with the same optic. So I think they handled everything right by having admin and instructors involved in the process. They they got buy-in all the way across the board. They got the support from the, from their city council county supervisors to do it. They attended instructor development training, and they implemented uh, an agency transition program that had everybody go through it. And one of my things is I don't don't excuse guys. If somebody says, "Hey, I don't want to go. Th I don't want to carry the dot," no, they still have to go through the transition training like everyone else. Um, let them learn how to use the optic. If they choose not to after that, I wouldn't force them to do it, but they had everybody go through it and adopt it. <coughs> you know, they have 62 sworn officers. They got 62 sworn officers carrying new pistols with optics now. Cool. Oh, what are they seeing as far as maintenance of the guns? So they're relatively new. I did their, I did their instructor development the first week of August. 
and they did their transition course about three weeks ago. So in turn, they haven't had the guns on long enough for, ma for maintenance to be an issue. They haven't had issues with any optics failing um, in a several hundred round course of fire over two days. Uh, no issues about batteries. None of our mounting, none of that has come up as of the conversation I had last night. All right. I, I'm going to offer some of my insight here, and I am by no means, by no means whatsoever, slamming my former organization. All right. Get people still there doing good work, and I am by no means slamming them. We have a very difference, just have a difference of opinion uh, on this topic. Uh, myself and some of the people at the agency. Yeah. You know, I consulted you. I consulted the LA Sheriff's Office guys. I consulted, I went to four different instructor uh, development classes throughout our whole rollout of authorizing optics. There was a very consistent thing as far as like the mounting. Degrees everything, dry fit, use this type of Loctite, let it cure 24 hours, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's what I was espousing. Well, somebody else told one of our instructors, just use Vibratite, all you got to do is wait 20 minutes. Well, that's easier than what I was saying we needed to do. Um, when I was the sole person in charge of some things, I always won the vote. Uh, when it became under the new administration, it became a committee vote of three. I got voted, outvoted two to one. All right. And, you know, that was one of the big contentious issues. Is because one of the other instructors would schedule a battery swap day. They go down there, they take off their optics because if they're running RMRs, which was the first thing we approved, they would take off their optic, put a new battery in, put Vibratite on it, wait 10, 20 minutes, check the zero, and they were going back on duty. And I'm like, no, guys, this is not the recommended whatever. And I basically just, let's just, it didn't go well. Yeah. Um, and what's interesting is, and I'll take this off of you, yeah. uh, everybody, every organization you mentioned has gone with Loctite. They have gone away from any of the other thread lockers. Yep. And most specifically, it's if they change it up, they go to red Loctite for the plates. Otherwise, everything is done with the blue Loctite, the, the Chapstick 248. Uh, and I've heard a few other colors thrown out, but not a, anything where I could even say they're common. Yeah. Um, another nearby agency, they decided to go with Glock MOSs with um, RMRs. And their training guy called me and said, hey, you've been doing a lot of work on this. What do you suggest? So I talked <laughs> about all the mounting stuff with them. I sent them the documents and everything that I had. Their solution was they bought a couple of extra pistols. The instructor keeps those pistols maintained. Eric, when it's time to change your battery, you bring your pistol to the instructor. You swap to one of the ones that the instructor is maintaining. He changes your battery, keeps it for the appropriate type period, checks zero, and then you swap back for your pistol. And that's the way they are handling handling. Now, it's not a super huge agency. Right but that's just the way they decided to address the issue. And that's a perfectly reasonable solution for that problem. It sounds like <clears throat> even in a large agency, it would be an easy fix. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons I like the Acro is one, the mounting system. Mm -hmm. And two, you can change the battery without taking the Acro, you know, the optic off the gun. And three, it's an enclosed emitter. And we're seeing more and more manufacturers even design teams that are realizing that one of the drawbacks to the R the RMR in its original design was that it had to be removed from the pistol to change the battery. So that's why you're seeing more and more closed emitter designs. You're seeing top mounted, you're seeing battery trays. Not that each of those doesn't have its own potential issue, but the one thing you don't have to do is, is disassemble the entire thing, go through the entire mounting process after changing the battery and wait that time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when we first authorized optics at the, at the old place, uh, would be going on right about four years ago. Um, and what we only authorized the RMR initially, uh, based on some information we were getting from some other sources. Uh, we had a close contact in with the federal agency. Uh, 
that had done testing and the RMR was the only optic that passed their testing. And so that's what we did initially. We then began to look at other optics. And before I left, I wrote a change to the, to the policy was we, we made a list of pre-approved optics mm -hmm. that said, if you want to buy anything that is not on this list, you have to get approval by two of the three firearms instructors. Um, in order to implement it. And the reason we did that was that with the technology changing so fast and, and manufacturers bringing out new optics is we didn't want to have to constantly be updating the list, everything like that. It was just, okay, if something new comes out that's good and everything, if two of the three instructors agree to it, then then we're good to go. I don't know what the policy, I've been gone almost a year, so I'm not sure if that, that policy is still in place or not. Uh, but, you know, the technology is ever-changing. And that is um, that is one of the challenges. Um, agencies, it is. You know, institutions like to, you know, they put policies down on paper, and if that's what's on paper or electrons, then that's the rule. And you know, you either have to change the policy, or you don't enforce your rules. And well, if you don't enforce your rules, then that's creating policy. You're creating a uh, way to get slammed in civil litigation, well, you don't enforce your policy here, why are you enforcing your policy there? Right. You've got, if you have the policy, you have to follow it and maintain it. Yeah. So you've got to constantly on, be on top of it or you don't write your policy in a way that locks you in. And that's why we went with the, yeah, two of the three people that are, are author, you know, approved to authorize the things have to agree. And if they do, then it's fine. And mm -hmm. we just filled out a form that, that you were okay. Um, I've seen a lot of optics fly off of guns due to incorrect mounting. I, I this last week, um, so we taught a pistol, uh, pistol mounted optics class last week, 22 students, about a thousand rounds of ball, about 50 rounds of frangible, five days, one night, multiple indoor and outdoor simulator runs, had one optic just straight up die on day two mm -hmm. uh, no idea why um so it was probably electronic because it wasn't it wasn't mechanical had another optic come loose in the mounting yeah. everything else was fine for the i was surprised to see that optic die um the way it did but mounting still seems to be kind of the biggest weak spot right and anytime you start adding in plates you start adding in more failure points yeah. so what i would if i had my preference it would be like Glock and Smith are doing, hopefully H and K will soon, where you can you can buy SKU from the factory, order a slide, order a pistol with a slide cut for either this or that. And this or that would be the RMR footprint or the acro footprint. Um, not limiting it to either of those two optics, but simply because of the range of good quality to eh. Um, unknown quality optic mounts, optics and mounts that are out there that will fit on that footprint. Yeah. Yeah. I have one instance of a deputy brought in his pistol and his optic. Um, that was the other thing in the original policy was that the optic had been mounted by one of the instructors. Mm -hmm. I mounted his optic. For some reason, he decided he wanted to swap something in it. And he took it off and put it back on himself and he cross-threaded a screw. And he showed up for something with one of the other instructors who noticed something wrong with the mount on his gun. They were like, who mounted your optic? Is oh, oh, Weems did. And the instructor just kind of stood there and stared at him. And I was like, and then I changed it and put it on. And <laughs> yeah, that's what we thought. And he had cross-threaded it. You know, that's the thing where can okay, aim point pro on a M4 carbine, pretty hard to mess that up. With a PMO, it's pretty easy to mess that up. With a bolt down into, it's yeah. less easy with the bolt across or the right. clamp, clamp onto, which is one of the reasons I prefer it, at least for duty use. And I understand yeah. there's some drawbacks to it because of the size and shape of the optic for concealed carry. 
but it, one of the reasons I prefer it, especially for duty, is it's harder to bugger up the bolting across. Okay. Uh, now, the question was phrased in the show group as it relates to agencies. Now, this is something that Joe Citizen, concealed carrying, doesn't have to worry about because it's easy to get the holster you want. And that, because you can just go get a codex bender to bend exactly what you want. Not always. And, yeah, but for agencies, I know you're wrong-handed, uh, but for, for for agencies, finding good duty care, mm -hmm. you know, there's really only one or two names out there that are producing duty gear now of inequality, and that's even questionable to some, some degree, uh, but you get what they want you to have, basically. It, uh, it depends on who you're dealing with. Um, I have my preference for duty holsters, but then again, I'm retired, so it's, I'm not necessarily using it every day. It's when I'm teaching and when I'm teaching or when I'm teaching on a contract and I have to have gun X with optic Y for that contract, which I've got one coming up. I'm doing a transition for a large Midwest agency. All their, their instructors are coming to a class I'm doing where they're going to spend two days with the manufacturer of the optic, have a morning off, and then spend two and a half days with me on how to teach it. And for that one, I had to hunt down a holster because I got, well, I have one of their pistols with an acro on it, you know, and the class will be done with the handgun they went to and the name point acro. Yeah. But you know, it appears that, uh, you know, like Safari land has decided that if you're running a optic on your gun, you're also running a flashlight on your gun. Yes. And that creates some holster fitment issues. Uh, particularly it leaves these wide gaps in there and foreign objects can get into your holster. <sighs> I can tell by the, the exasperated sound that you don't want to discuss that. It's not that I don't want to discuss it. I yeah. will say I use US duty gear holsters. That's who yeah. I've been, I've, I've transitioned to several years ago. Yeah. Years ago. That's who I've been staying with. They do not suffer from this. I have put a video yeah. out yeah. Over on my Instagram page um, about like trying to find the way into the trigger guard. I know there are some that do. Yeah. Yes, I understand that we have had a gun go bang, but we've also got 18,000 agencies plus or minus 750,000 cops plus or minus. Yeah. I don't know if it is as big a deal as it is being perceived as in terms of being able to access the trigger because of the holster dimensions due to having a weapon mounted light. I am hopeful that we will see narrower weapon mounted lights that minimize that. But then you, but then again, you also have manufacturers who have been building holsters so wide that that has become an issue and others haven't. Yeah. Uh, I also transitioned to US duty gear, uh, mainly because you suggested them. Uh, and I don't see the fit an issue with them, although I did return one holster that like, yeah, this, this is too much. Um, I'm not a big fan of alien gear, but the rapid force uh, holster uh, does a pretty good job, but then they're only making it for the TLR seven. Yeah. Size lines. There, I have, I had, I had two of the alien gear rapid force holsters. They sent them to me for M and P's and I can't remember what light specifically mm -hmm. they sent with it. Um, I, I was, I was pleasantly surprised. It was not what I was no. thought it would be. I've gotten some feedback from guys on the arrest and control side of things, defensive tactics, depending on what you call it, that they have encountered issues with that holster and the number of fasteners in it during a week long hands-on school, not a shooting package, but a week long hands-on school in that world. I, but that's kind of the only feedback I've gotten is from the guys who teach in that realm saying they've had issues with it. The current Blackhawk T series stuff, if they make it for your combination, yeah. seems to work very well. I have one for a staccato with an X300 and an optic, and it works very well for that combination. But that's it, right? Yeah, I, I did get a Safari Land Solus holster for a Glock 45 and a TLR7. Mm -hmm. And there's no way with that holster. Uh, for a finger or for, for an object to get in uh, to the light. But again, that's for what the TLR7, not my preferred light, which is an X300. And, and I prefer the X300 Turbo. I've 
I have spent some time with Mod Lights PL350. To me, the drawback is the switchology on that one. Lights, the light itself, especially in terms of output, solid, both the, the full size and the compact. It's just the switchology on that. Um, it pains me to admit it, but the TLR7 HLX, their newest one with a longer, deeper reflector um, for a defensive light, not a go out, look for people light is a very solid choice a little bit longer. So you either need a new holster or you have to be comfortable taking a heat gun to your existing holster. But on those, there's not a problem getting the, there's not a problem with the finger going down in the areas it shouldn't. And it will be nice to see some narrower lights that have better output. And I'm sure if I had one shot, they, they were doing limited show showing up. Uh, the TLR7 is an issued light, so I don't have much 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 uh, choice in that regard. Uh, it's, here's your issued light, and so if you can go to the HLX version, I would go to the HLX version. Uh, I very much prefer the Safari Land products. Uh, I mean, not the Safari Land, the Surefire, but uh, you know, just personal preference. I really prefer not to have a weapon mounted light on the pistol at all. But it, it's interesting because I have an ALS duty holster for a Smith & Wesson MMP with an optic on it from Safari Land that does not require a light. It was made specifically without the light, but that's not a catalog product anymore. Yeah. yeah. Uh, any other things you're seeing from the agency adoption standpoint? <sighs> authorized versus issued. I think it's probably the biggest one. We have a lot of places doing authorized. Um, I don't know what the transition training in all the places is. I know what what my preference, my recommendation is, but I just don't know um, how often that's going on. It was really good to get the feedback from this East Coast agency where they had implemented just about everything that I had recommended, right? They include classroom time, multiple stints on the range, totaling about, right about 15, 16 hours. It was about a 700 round transition, if I remember right from going back through and reading their whole transition plan. Um, even naysayers, people who are initially like, why can't we just go shoot it? We're like, by the time they were done, they're like, oh, now we get this. We actually understand why the transition package was built the way it was. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, one of my downfalls as chief was allowing personally owned weapons versus the agency issue and only the agency issue. And I thought I was doing a good thing by coming up with a list. Uh, you can carry anything on this list, mm -hmm. you know, with pre-approved modifications of like sites and that kind of stuff like that. Um, but only this list. And then it got to be a constant battle of why can't this be on the list? Why can't, the, but I don't want to do this. I never had that problem when it was you're carrying the agency gun and only the agency gun. I came from an organization, spent 29 years in it, where we had a very liberal, in the correct use of the word, yeah. firearms policy, specifically personally owned weapons. Um, I was sworn in with a Model 66 on my hip. The next day, I went to the range for orientation, transition to a 1911, and never looked back to it. I mean, I carried a revolver as a backup gun. Um, that was it. We did run into some issues down the road over time with people wanting to carry stuff that were like, we're not convinced that's a good quality product, right? Yeah. What's well, a 1911? It's a 1911 that's not from Colt yeah. or Springfield, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, and maybe that's not the best quality 1911. And there yeah. were times, that gun and others, yeah. where we were able to get the lieutenant, who was the program manager at the time, to back us. Yeah. There were other times we didn't get the backing. Yeah. Okay. Ultimately, it's not it's not my my concern. Yeah. I have expressed to the admin, um, the people that ran the program, what my issues were with that platform, with that specific product, make and model. Mm -hmm. Right. And they chose to sign off on it. Okay. Yeah. Now I can specifically think of that that one that I'm thinking of. It had more than its share of stoppages. Right now, yes, we all know 1911s will cause amnesia in the owner about about its reliability. But yeah. the, this one had far more than normal. 
but ultimately the lieutenant signed off on it and that yeah. deputy wanted to carry it. Okay, that's on you. Yeah. Um, I ran into constant issues of like guys showing up. Um, personally on AR, that was the AR itself was a little questionable and then to have some like a sight mark optic on top of it. Yeah, because well, they were doing it because of dollars. And I'll have an article coming out here in about a month on a um, new off-duty gun that one manufacturer has released. And, and it's fascinating because 10, 15 years ago, I'd have been like, no way in hell. But now realizing the monetary issue for some folks, like I'd rather have this that may not be a name. But from what I saw watching 20 plus people shoot a whole lot of ammo through this thing and see where the glitches were, like, I'll take that. Right in, in a place where maybe I can't afford a staccato with an optic and an X three hundred turbo on it, um, as a bat, as an off duty gun. You know, we did within the program specify that any of this stuff had, if it wasn't issued, it had to be approved by the staff. So while like on the handgun, there were a couple ones we lost. We were generally pretty good at keeping out the subpar ARs with the subpar optics. Right. Like, no, you're not running that combination. Right. Like if you want, you can go to that gun. Right. Which is going to cost you another 75 bucks, but you can't, we're not going to sign off on that. Yeah. yeah I just, that's one. I, I don't ever intend to run an agency again, but if I find myself having to do it, to pay my bills, um, that's going to be one thing. That's going to be, we're going to have, I'm going to pick the gun and the gear and this is it. I'm just not going to argue with people over it. I don't know that I would ever go to 100%. You have to only carry this one gun because you could run into issues a la Hanson versus FBI where that gun just does not work for that individual officer. And we're going to need to make accommodations. I, I, I understand that. I, I actually bought Smith and Wesson shields for some female deputies at their choice. Right. And if I ran into that situation, you know, I picked this gear for the agency and I had somebody that it wasn't working for. Well, then, okay, we're going to make this accommodation. And, and that's what happened yeah. because, like, even yeah. LAPD, LAPD, LA Sheriff's Department, two of the largest agencies in the country, both have these are our issue weapons and these are our, you know, agency approved, personally owned weapons. And I see that being manageable, especially if they can manage, manage it on the size and scale that they have. Um, but I would have much narrower parameters, yeah. like fewer, far fewer weapons that would fall into that category um, than maybe we looked at previously where I was. Yeah. All right. Anything else on optics? Mounting still a thing. T stay up on the batteries. Pay attention to how long the batteries last. Um, Red and green, I don't think it's an argument. It kind of depends on how people's eyes see stuff. Uh, there's a blue pistol-mounted uh, pistol mounted optic with a blue reticle on it out there. I would stay away from amber. I, I'm kind of curious, like I want to see it and shoot it in the desert. But at this point, I would stay away, away from that one. It'd be really hard to recommend it just because of the, the, the color scheme. Okay. Who's making the blue reticle? A company called Lucid. Okay. There's supposedly some research behind it, and I've been trying to talk to them to get my hands on either one of the rifle or pistol ones, because just because I want to shoot it and see how that color pans out. All right. Um, you had someone send you a question about must do shotgun modifications. Yeah, so I can't. I think I said it to you, so I can't remember the exact wording on it because I don't have it up right now. Okay, it's it's unloaded. This is the best job I can do of showing you that it's unloaded. Uh, Beretta thirteen oh one happens to be in my hands. Sights that you can see, that be they iron or electronic. A light on it, so that you if it's a defensive gun, so that you can absolutely ensure that you're you're not dealing with somebody who has a reason to be there or could be temporarily confused that you can visually confirm that the entity that you're dealing with the person you're dealing with is a bad guy right because the alternative sucks um while most home defense shootings probably aren't going to exceed the capacity 
of the magazine tube. There is concern about the limited capacity, onboard capacity of a shotgun. So I would have a way to carry extra ammunition. Uh, initially, it would be sights I can see, a light, and extra ammo. Do I need a sling? Not for home defense. Maybe for a class, right? But one of the reasons that the law, law enforcement and military is running the slings on everything is because they need to free their hands up to do stuff. Climb over fences, climb over walls, put their hands on people, treat people, do some things that probably as a normal human being, you're not going to have to do. Um, I would. There's discussion about the overall length of pull on the shotguns right now. I've got a friend who, who is looking at guns being far longer, but he's also a large mammal. Uh, if you can get down to around a 13 inch length of pull, I think that's reasonable. A little shorter, like less than half an inch, wouldn't be bad. That's where most of mine are. Um, if you have a recoil pad on it of any size, I would look at rounding off the top of it. Um, it I didn't know this, but the folks at Van Comp call it a gun sight mod. It's rounded off top so it doesn't snag if you're coming up from an outdoor ready where you've got the buttstock down around the belt and you're bringing it up mm -hmm. on it. Beyond that, if I were to add anything else, a follower that I absolutely could distinguish from any other type of ammo out there. Most of my guns have an open kind of stainless steel ring that, that Bang has made over the years. Uh, it looks like a stainless steel donut. Uh, Adam Roth at Eridus Industries recently mm -hmm. sent me one of his new ones. And probably the best way to describe it is a dragon mated with some sort of jewels to create this thing. It's like a neon emerald green with all sorts of spiky points on it. Um, and you cannot mistake that for anything out there on the planet. It, it doesn't look like a shell. It doesn't come close to looking like anything else. Um, and the points on it that I'm saying are like the jewels are very tactile, clear that this is not a shell in there if you're feeling for it. Uh, I will concur on several of those. Uh, number one, the follower. I have an old 870P that I absolutely love. The follower that was in it when I got it looked exact and felt exactly like the back end of a shotgun shell. Like I would actually have to shine a flashlight in there and look at it to be able to tell the difference. And I replaced it uh, post haste. Uh, I do carry extra ammo on the guns just because it makes me feel better. Mm -hmm. um, and if I'm carrying it in a duty vehicle, I prefer the Aridus QDC on there because I feel like it protects the shotgun shell uh, from all the bouncing around and everything that happens inside of a patrol vehicle. For a gun that's just going to be in the house, uh, I've got no problem with the van comp cards yeah. and the thing affixed directly to the to the side of the receiver. Matter of fact, I can argue in favor of those in some instances. Uh, I have seen those wear out over time. Uh, at an unfortunate time, and let's just say I was shooting a shotgun test at an institution that you're familiar with, I have one that was very well broken in. I was like, well, I'm not going to switch to a new one because I get the shells out of this one so fast. And I bought some uh, Winchester AAA hole or AA AAA holes, whatever they call the real slick ones, at Walmart the night before the test because my gun was having some issues feeding. I said, oh, I'll, I'll run these. And they were so slick that they were flying out of the elastic. Uh, that was a user issue, not a design issue, though. Um, so but uh, I, I, on, on the Vang stuff, um, those are made for Vang by the Sam and her crew down at the Wilderness. Yeah. What I appreciate about those specific cards is they have a very thick, very durable, very stout elastic. Mm -hmm. And this is not a shot at any other manufacturers, but every other manufacturer I have seen, they use a much thinner, mm -hmm. maybe 10 to 15% yeah. the size of the Vang elastic um, that is not as durable over time as the elastic that the Wilderness is using on the Vang cards. Like I have no problem with those trusting them brass up, brass down. Yeah. I used to run STAC and then I switched over to Vang. Um, but like I said, on, on all my work guns that I carried, I ended up going with the Aridus QDCs on them just because I love the way it protects the, sh the shells. Yeah. Uh, I really don't think you're going to get to a point where you're reloading in a shotgun gun fight. Uh, now, a barricaded thing where you're trading rounds with each other just to amuse each other, maybe. 
Um, the only way, way I can see it is if you have, and these, these were common on the West Coast for a while, the follow home two to four bad guy robberies, where the seemed the common weapon of choice was some sort of very high capacity nine or these AR AK pistols. And I could see a situation where you hit the first one or two bad guys and the second ones decided to stay. Okay. But fleeing was far more common, right? So yeah, I don't see running out of ammo on the shotgun. I just, from having seen what happened in the LE world where if you didn't yeah. take time to grab extra ammo, you were dealing with the problem based on what was on the gun. Yeah. Right. And so for that, I, I have the idea of having four five or six extra shells on the gun, depending on what carrier type you use to me is a good thing. Like I'm not going to argue against it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I know in class we do a lot of reload drills and everything, getting the gun running. I don't see much evidence of that actually coming into play in the real world i have put a much heavier emphasis in my non le shotgun classes on the initial chambering than on sustained loading yeah right like starting out with the gun in closet ready aka cruiser ready right to where you now have to work the action release the shell work the action chamber that round and get in the fight from there and doing that enough that we start to lay down the pathway for that uh, to sites, I'm curious as to how my new surgically improved eyes are gonna gonna react because I had gotten I just could not see the like a bead not gone to some sort of peep sight on everything uh, or rifle type sites. I, I have gone to optics on everything. It's just preference. Um, recently, I was shooting a gun from one manufacturer where the optic failed. And I'm waiting to see if that was a temporary failure, if that was a permanent failure on that optic. Um, but at 10 yards, I was missing the head with double out buck. Um, oh. That was that was not comforting. That same time frame, all the student, most of the students I had coming through three shotgun blocks were using shotguns donated by Mossberg, uh, the new 590s guns that all had beads on the barrel. So one of the things I had to do for each of the sessions was before they ever fired a shot they were going to be shooting on steel i took them down to where they could and shot on cardboard rounds at 10 15 and 20 yards where they could see look i am putting the bead here to get it here like this is not point of aim point of impact right like understand that you're going to have to aim low to to get hits in now it's not like hold at the belly button to shoot the face. Um, but there, there is some offset involved in this. It was, it was kind of eye-opening for some of the students who didn't understand, it, especially those that are gotten so used to optics or pistol sights where we're trying to get them to point of aim, point of impact. Yeah, my preferred sight for a shotgun was always the uh, the, the sights that mimicked uh, the Trichicon pistol sights. And I had those on several 870s and I love those. Uh, for close in speed work with the shotgun. Uh, um, they did not work well on still shots at distance because the front sight was wider than the targets. But, Steve uh, Fisher, the folks at Night Force, Night, sorry, Night Fusion. I apologize, Night Fusion. Mm -hmm. uh, and Vang just had kind of recently brought that to fruition. Um, it was fascinating because, you know, the farther along we go, the more we go back. When I had a chance to shoot that gun for a review, I'm like, oh, this is just like my 121 M1, you know, Benelli H and K shotgun in terms of the sights, like very similar yeah. like sights on the two guns, almost 40 years apart. Yeah. Um, on my 1301, I've got an optic. I got a got an aim point on that, and you know, if you've got a way to mount it and everything, and you can go with a very robust optic, I, I very much think that's the way to go uh, now because the technology. Uh, allows us to. Uh, I still love those old Trichicon pistol sights on my old 870s. So. There's nothing wrong with them, but for commonality, uh, I'm going to go to optics on everything. Yeah. So that I, I am looking at a dot, a reticle, mm -hmm. and everything works the same way. And be able to, for me, with my eyesight, get off of trying to focus on a front sight, looking through a rear at the front, no matter how good those are, 
right? And I'm going to have a gun set up with them. I, I still prefer the dot for me. Have you seen any of the new production 870s? Yes. Any insights you'd be willing to share? Um, I should have asked you that offline. I'm sorry. <laughs> so let me say this. I Law enforcement wise, I grew up on the 870. When I started in 89 onward, we had 870s that we could track well back well before 1968. Those guns ran and ran. Uh, we bought, my old agency bought several hundred 14 inch barrel guns in the early 00s. And I saw far more quality control, quality assurance issues with those. Um, in a recent class, I saw what the owner described as a very new Remington 870. Uh, it was one of the detachable box magazine fed versions. The upper receiver, and I'm going to show you this on the Beretta, but on the back of the upper receiver on those that should be milled as the rear sight, right? And it should be serrated and that's mm -hmm. cut for the rear sight with the beat up on the front. It was a straight line. Um, the finish was not what I have expected from Remington historically over the years. And it was flat. There was no channel. There was no serration. There was no milling. The pattern on that gun at 15 yards with whatever double lot buck the guy brought to the class was about a 20 inch pattern stringing vertically. I gave him a round of Hornaday Versatite expecting a different outcome. And we got the same outcome. So now, I'm not blaming Remington for that. Barrels are barrels, right? We all know that that shotgun barrels can change radically, but the totality of those things was like, ooh, if that's the current production gun, I don't know if I can recommend it. Yeah, the, the only one I feel comfortable recommending off the shelf these days is a Brita 1301, and the money on those is just kind of astronomical. Um, I, I have heard feedback on a couple of folks having issues with the trigger packs, and when I say couple, I mean two. Okay. Trigger pack on a 13101, trigger pack on an A300. Um, my reference would be if you're looking to buy a pump gun, uh, Mossberg 590 at this point. I would probably steer someone onto a Beretta A300. Not that the 1301 is bad, but when you look at the money differences versus performance, it's incredibly hard for me to argue against the A300 Patrol. Uh, I've seen, you know, the production literature on those, the advertising. I have not had a chance to run one. Um, I would think that based on the people who were involved in it, that I would think it would be a very well done shotgun. I'm about a year and a half into time with an A300, and I am very impressed with that gun. Okay. All right. My 1301 is an old Gen 1 that I bought when they were blowing them out uh, to bring out the second version of those. It's been spectacular. Or the amount of rounds I've put through it. Um, I keep it just so I have an auto loader to use for shotgun demonstrations. I, I've got two old 870Ps that uh, I will probably grab for shotgun work if I need to. Um, and I've got a couple, of, I've got a 590A1 and a 590 short barrel. I will suggest that if you go to a Mossberg, that an absolute must upgrade is go into a safety that has uh, the metal detent ball instead of the plastic detent ball. That's how you got to get it done. Yeah. Mossberg loaned several shotguns. Uh, Jeremy Stafford over there got them to us for a recent event. And they had the new, the new design thumb safety from them, which is actually like <sighs> recessed front and back. So it's more like a football shape, like half a football shape, but it's recessed. Yeah. on the back for pushing forward and on the front for hooking and thumbing and pulling back. Yeah. Um, I, no issues noted with that over three different sessions. So uh, I know Vane makes a safety for the Mossbergs and I think Brown Ellis makes a, a safety for the play. Mossberg. They both have a metal detent in them instead of the plastic. Uh, the reason for that is the plastic detent one sometimes will break and your safety gets stuck halfway between the on and off positions and your gun is completely locked up and that's not a good thing. Uh, I'm sorry. I had some, some noise being made. Oh, that's fine. Uh, anything else on shotguns? No, we're doing thunder stick summit here in a few weeks up at the farm um, outside of Lehigh, Utah, down Utah County, Utah. 
uh, Steve Fisher, Greg Elifert, Daryl Bulky, Rob and Matt Hot, Mark Fricky, myself, all teaching shotgun. As far as I know, that's sold out. But I know Beretta is going to be there. The folks at uh, from Berna with the less lethal ammunition are going to be there. We're going to have some more industry folks in that one than we've had in the past. So looking forward to doing that. I will be, as it stands now, I will be doing all the teaching at that one with a 1301 and with uh, one of the new 590s. Yeah. Uh, something activated my 12-legged alarm system there in the background. So I'm okay. sorry that came, that, that came through. Didn't hear it, but I'm deaf. Uh, <laughs> um, had kind of a late question come into the group, but I just, just saw it when I was looking at my phone just then. Um, I'm going to preface this and going back to something that you already brought up. There are 18,000 law enforcement agencies in the United States, roughly. Uh, the question wants to know was what any of the agencies that stand out as having a very progressive uh, firearms training program. Again, 18,000 of them, there's probably going to be some we're going to miss. Matter of fact, I'm sure that and I'll apologize. Miss. I will apologize in advance to everybody that, that I bypass. It's entirely possible there are. There is a shift going on in law enforcement firearms training that foundation I completely agree with. We are seeing a greater emphasis on performance shooting um, in terms of being movement, moving from point A to point B, engaging multiple targets, which isn't just two, three, four bad guys. It can be a moving bad guy yeah. as well. I, I think the agencies that are starting down that road are making a good decision. I would be leery if the only reason, if what they're pushing is speed, because, and I, sh I shoot competitively, but I am not a competitive shooter. If that makes that, that rephrasing makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, if the goal is your split times on two shots and moving on to the next target, I don't think that's the way for an agency to go. What I think is better decision-making ability to deal with moving from point A to point B ability to deal with one target or what looks to be a one target that moves or multiple bad guys from different uncomfortable, awkward positions is only going to help the officer, the deputy, the trooper, the agent out on the street. So places that are doing that, I would think it's awesome. If you have a place that is stuck in bare minimum standards, right? Um, Wayne Dobbs says no officer left behind. If you have agencies that are doing that, um, you're going to get bit by it here probably fairly soon in the way things are changing. Um, to, to go down the path successfully, you have to have the time to do it, right? Because it's not put 12 people up online and give commands. You've got to be able to let folks move, which means you need the range space for them to do it. We're in an era where we're losing ranges like it's going out of style. Agencies think they can run 15-yard Qualls and ranges, you know, so which means they only need a range that's maybe 17, 18 yards deep. Problem is that we know that we have events that go farther and we know that confidence comes from being able to do things that are difficult. Um, I taught a class back in August up towards the northern border where the agency that brought us in is, is taking the lead on an armed school staff program. And we had the armed school staff, not necessarily just the SROs, but school employees shooting handguns back at 25, 35 yards on B8s on the A zone of IPSEC targets, because that's going to be the type of precision that's demanded. Once you get to where they can do that, then you can start adding in the other things, right? We, we can move from point A to point B and re-engage as long as they can hit. If they can't hit, then the rest of that stuff is is not going to matter. Yeah. Any specific agencies that come out that you would like to name? I see a number of them. What I do, what I will say is, I see more officers or current or former retired officers that are putting on training that are that are bringing those things in. Um, necessarily, rather than like I can point to a specific agency that's mm -hmm. doing. Uh, because I don't see it from the agencies. I see it from the officers or the instructors. And some of that's private sector. Some of that's public sector. 
Right. I'm going to name a few that just stand out. And again, this is heavily qualified in that there are 18,000 agencies out there. Eric and I aren't going to know all of them. Um, Zenio, Ohio uh, comes immediately to mind. That's an agency of like 40 to 50 officers, I think. And it's got nine range master certified instructors on staff. Um, if there's that much range master influence in their training program, they're probably doing the right thing. Uh, I haven't met them all firsthand or anything like that, but I, I hear good things about that agency. Uh, the Tuscaloosa, Alabama Police Department has got a really good guy running their training program, and they are they do a really good job of hosting. Is that uh, the Sheriff's of, Department there? Or uh, the, I'm, the PD is who I'm talking about. Uh, there's the Sheriff's they Department. Get the sheriff, yeah, the Sheriff's yeah. Office also does. does oh, it depends on the state. Uh, there are those that God loves and those that God doesn't, I guess. Um, the Tuscaloosa, Alabama Police Department does a really good job of hosting a lot of the nationally known instructors as, and then getting their instructor staff through those classes and that spreads uh, throughout the agency. Tuscaloosa, Alabama Sheriff's Office has a very good training facility that is also hosting uh, a lot of good people and they tend to work in conjunction uh, with each other. So I would say... The, one of the list of places I wouldn't pick a gunfight with the cops would be anywhere in Tuscaloosa County. Um, the, those guys seem to do pretty well. Um, those are the ones that jump out. Of course, you know, my, my former agency, I think, does a pr much better job than most everybody else. And, and I, I think my, my, old, my old organization does too. Yeah. Um, but I also know they're limited with time. Yeah. It, um, as when I left part time work last year, there were some things I'm seeing that they still weren't doing, but part of that's locations of time and facilities. Yeah. Uh, I'll say this about my, my former agency is we have built an extreme level of proficiency there for, by law enforcement standards, turnover, retirements, everything decimated yep. that. And while you still have a core group of people that were around when we built that initial uh, uh, level there, um, average deputy on the street doesn't have what the guys did 10 years ago and they're struggling to deal with that now uh i will say they probably do better than what most other agencies are out there still doing for a big agency um i i will mention both la sheriffs and la police department mm -hmm. both of those agencies are very large they have programs that are putting out very solid practitioners not the they may have an occasional whoops mm -hmm. um, or performance that isn't necessarily as high. But those organizations are both doing very good work for given their size. Um, one thing with Los Angeles Police Department, they have the bonus shoots and they encourage not only in terms of an, an award worn on the uniform and medal, but with a financial compensation for being a competent, capable shooter. Yeah. And I think things along those lines, and you know, that's on a multiple turning target engagement course of fire that hasn't changed in decades, but you have to, you have to push to pass and whether or not that's quote performance shooting in what some people think it is, it is definitely requires individuals who can run the gun at a fairly high level with multiple targets where they're not going off of a beep or a verbal, they're going off a of visual initiation of a fight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm sure there are lots of agencies out there that we're just, just we just haven't come across right. and just don't know about. Um, yeah, and there are great individual instructors at a lot of agencies. There's only so much you can do uh, as one instructor uh, amongst the tide, and agency of nurse is a powerful thing. Folks, I was the chief for 12 years, and there was only so much I could get done when I had the building pulpit. Uh, I can't imagine what it's like for a guy or an instructor out there that's having to fight with their agency. Mm -hmm. I, I saw how harder, much harder it got just when I couldn't say, this is what we're going to do. Right. And uh, so I don't hold, I don't hold this necessarily that cops can't shoot. Yeah. Uh, I've seen decent normal human beings who can do amazing things with a handgun, shotgun, rifle. Yeah. And I've seen decent, normal human beings who are fairly new on their journey, yeah. right? I've seen cops who have done amazing things under some mm -hmm. 
pretty, pretty terrible circumstances, right? I've seen some incredibly competent law enforcement officers with a, with a significant amount of training who, when you hear them talk about their event, they learned a lot of lessons from it, right? And I, I'm thinking of one right now. He's got a video that's, that's up on YouTube about an event where he fired multiple shots. He pre-planned firing multiple shots and changed in the middle of the event and how he had to react to it and how that's changed his teaching, right? Um, doesn't matter what color clothes you put on at the start of your work day, right? It matters how much time and effort you've put into what you're doing. Yeah. If I have to go into a situation and I get a random select, my choice of a random selection of cops versus a random selection of gun owners, I'm going to take the random selection of cops as my team. Now, if it's going to be a random selection of cops versus a random selection of private citizens who actively seek training, I may go with the private citizens on that for just the shooting problem. But we know, you and I both know there's a lot more than the sh just the shooting problem. Yes. And as kind of a counterpoint to that, um, there's a now retired federal agent I used to work with uh, many years ago. He was he was asked about this, and I'm going to paraphrase the statement because I can't remember it exactly. But the gist of it was, if I had to take any 10 competition shooters or any 10 police officers, I would take I would go to the any 10 police officers because they are used to having to work within the confines of law and decision making that's held to a constitutional yeah. standard yeah. they may not be your best shooters but they can more often than not make the best decisions in bad yeah. circumstances yeah yeah and so i did qualify with my answer with fourth issue oh, yeah. problem yes. in this yeah. all right uh john renan asked a question in the, in the share group and john if we knew the answer to this question uh <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to paraphrase it was, how do you expand the training market beyond the enthusiast? And John, if anyone out there can crack that code, please send it to us and tell us what the answer is, because every firearms instructor on the planet wants to know the answer to that question. Yeah, you've just got to get people to realize the consequences, yeah. right? Realize what their true level of performance is. You know, we were talking about law enforcement get cops out to matches and let them let them get their butt whooped by a plumber and by an operating engineer mm -hmm. and then like see what good really looks like on the shooting and moving side maybe not necessarily the decision side yeah. but on the shooting and moving side um and then hope that once people see that they they will start to seek out trading on their own but without a mandate and we don't want the government coming in and mandating higher levels of training, right? You're not going to get people there. You know, because it's like, look at cars. How long have we been driving? hundred and some odd years. How many of these folks would you trust on a track running a hot lap at some place like Sears Point, you know, or any of the other high-end race, raceways, right? But they've been driving forever. Funny you mentioned that because the class that I was going to, uh, not this past week, but week before that. So I went to a high speed driving class. And um, uh, I, I did several 360s going down the track. Mm -hmm. um, it ain't as simple as just steer the car around, yeah. around the track. Yeah. Not at taking a sweeping curve when you enter the curve at 95 miles an hour. It, it's not. Um, I, I was fortunate. My initial law enforcement public safety driver's training was yeah. done by the Bondurant School of Racing. They had the contract at the time from my academy to teach our driving. Yeah. Doesn't doesn't mean I haven't dented a car, right? I just I got to see what good behind a wheel looked like really early on. Yeah. So, um, you know, when I went through the academy, we went through the EVOC Emergency Vehicle Operators course. But none of that was like extremely high speed driving. It was driving to negotiate this cone course without hitting a cone. Uh, go through this braking exercise. Um, we have a skid pan, yep. which is a Teflon coated track with water being sprayed across it. And the instructor can air brake your car and they make you steer through an obstacle and then they start breaking your car and you have to drive out of it. That was EVOC for me. Um, I was completely out of my comfort zone in this high speed class. Completely. The slow speed backing corn cut 
cone courses and stuff, <sighs> at least in California, where thank God I fled from, it was all mandated because Post looked at all at the accidents. They were able to go out and gather a bunch of agency data on accidents. Mm -hmm. crash a metric buttload of cars at under 25 miles an hour because we yeah. can't back drive and park at low speed yeah. when we wreck over 50 75 it's spectacular but the norm <laughs> is us denting fenders and quarter panels because we can't judge mm -hmm. space yeah yeah I, I will say this too is i'm not a gear guys and blame the gear right. uh but the gear when it comes to our car is a much bigger deal than the gear when it comes to a pistol. Yeah. Uh, as I found out, uh, I did multiple 360s down the track. We went to lunch and I'm thinking, oh man, I'm never going to make it through this. Yeah. Uh, come back after lunch and one of the instructors says, hey, who was driving car 79? I was like, that, that was me? He goes, yeah, I was playing during lunch. Uh, the traction control is out in your car. You need to switch. <laughs> Oh, okay. So I go get another car that have working traction control. And all of a sudden I was keeping the car on the track. And yeah, and yeah we, the gear mattered in that instance. And we forget about MDCs, radios, prisoner cages, yeah. second prisoner cages, tinting, and how all of those things impact and affect what we're doing. And it was kind of funny too, is they asked everybody in the class, okay, what's your, your uh, patrol vehicle? And you're going around the room and you're getting all these people naming the stuff. Of course, the SUVs are becoming more popular now uh, than they used to be. And I was like, well, let me give you mine in descending order. Four-wheel drive, F-150. Uh, Four-wheel drive, Chevy 2500 HD. Four-wheel drive, Expedition. And they were kind of looking at it, it's like, yeah, I don't chase people. Uh, I, I, that's not never been my thing. Everything. I said I had old Crown Vic for a while and everything, but I've never driven some of the, the super duper like, cars. The way they it works here in Georgia is it used to be at 135,000 miles. I don't know if that's still the number. They would take the trooper cars at 135 and then they would give them to the training center. And those were the cars that we used for the high speed classes. And then as they deteriorated over time, they moved to the other things. Or like the last thing a car would be getting used for would be out on the skid pan or as a pit car. And you do not want to go to the auction and, and buy one of those. Let me tell you, citizens of Georgia, taxpayers of Georgia, you get every ounce of every penny that was spent on a state patrol car. And that... And now that the, the SUVs are becoming popular, they're taking like the GBI Tahoes and they've got a high speed center of gravity course they're doing with them, everything. Let me tell you, we get all the goody out of a car when we buy it here. Uh, there's nothing left of those suckers when, when they're done. But it was, it was fun. It was a challenge. Uh, I was well outside of my comfort zone. Um, if you come to the Range Master Instructor Reunion, um, I think it's the end of November out in the San Antonio area. You're going to see some of the stuff that I pulled from that as an instructor, uh, teaching principles, going between different uh, techniques and disciplines that will apply um, that I'm not going to give away here on the show because that's also going to be part of a course that I'm going to be teaching uh, coming up soon, hopefully. Um, but, you know, teaching is teaching no matter what you're driving or what you're shooting or what you're doing. It is. There's a thing. All right. One last question to finish this out. Um, we had someone ask, why is the Serpa still a thing? And I, you know, I think the Serpa is much less of a thing than it used to be. I don't see it being pushed like it was for yeah. so long. Uh, I think people still have it. I think it's a case of like 1911 reliability amnesia. They haven't had, they haven't encountered the issues or encountered the degree of issues that causes them to change their opinion on it right i, I wasn't a fan of it um so it was never one i went down the road of i made a point when we switched to gen 4 9 mil pistols at work that we got new holsters for investigations which did away with the serpa right once the new holsters came in because they were issued glock 26 27s before um, that did away with that issue 
you know, are they still there? Yeah. Do people still have them? Yeah. I don't know why. Um, the number of places that have said we will not allow these on our facility mm -hmm. is pretty epic. Um, and not just like at gun site, but there's a number of places that have all said we are not going to allow those to be used. And yet some people want to insist that they're still fine. Okay, knock your socks off. I'm not going to wear one. I'm not going to carry one. The one time in my life I owned a Serpa, I was still in the guard. It was my last annual training. I was for that trip, I was issued an M9 pistol and I didn't realize it was going to happen. So I didn't have a holster with me. Um, the only thing that was available at clothing sales was the leg mounted version with the must, the much thicker version of the Serpa. And I was using it with a double action pistol. So I wasn't as concerned about it because I also wasn't carrying it with around in the chamber um, as I would have been in any other role. But even that one, I destroyed that thing after that trip was over and I was out of the guard. Yeah. I don't see them much anymore. So I don't know how big of a thing that they are. Uh, and if you're listening to this show, you're probably in the, in the, uh, or watching it on YouTube, you're probably in the camp of, yeah, why would anybody ever use that anyway? Uh, I very, very rarely do I see one anymore. We don't see them at all here, but we have told everybody repeatedly over the last several years, like, no. First it was, we're going to disable it. Then we're going to break it in the last few years. It's just been outright. No, don't even bother showing up. Yeah. Uh, thankfully, you know, as, as you said, there are places that don't allow them. Uh, our main state training agency for a long time did not allow them. And then people got overruled by chiefs and sheriffs that were complaining to the brass and, and that got things changed. But then we don't see them much anymore. Uh, Fletzy doesn't allow them either. And those are the two big places where people here would go for training. So that may have something to do with it. Um, I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't allow them in my classes as a general rule, uh, just because why should I allow somebody to do something that's, that I know leads to problems. But uh, occasionally I will have somebody show up. I had a husband and wife duo that were coming to classes for a little while and they always wanted to come with the Serpa, they both seem to operate them well and they would, they would do it with them. And so I, I would let them, but typically I, I discourage people from, from using them. Um, you know, if you want something with retention, get one of those Safari Land GLS holsters. Um, that know. would probably be one of the much better choices if you needed a retention holster for whatever you're doing with it. Well, that's all of the questions that we had that we we're able to get to, except for the bonus round of uh, how do you maintain your mustache, Eric? We did have a, a from I wanted to know yeah. the answer to that. So uh, I'd like to thank Alex for asking that question. Uh, I am blessed. I, I have a really solid barber um, who's doing a good job keeping keeping everything in check when I'm off the road and, and being able to get that done. Um, other than that, it's just plain old head and shoulders. And a little bit of beard oil on occasion. <laughs> no, he didn't ask how I maintained mine, so that must tell me something. Well, Alex was pretty <laughs> clear. It was my, my magnificent right. fashion facial hair. Not That's yours. Right. That's right. That's what I'm saying. He only asked yours, so uh, that tells me something about mine. <laughs> All right, Eric, what you got coming? Uh, like I mentioned Thunderstick Summit's coming up. Uh, three days of very solid defensive shotgun uh, instruction. That's all sold out. I'll be back in the Midwest towards the end of the month doing a uh, pistol-mounted optics instructor transition for a large agency back there. Uh, then down to the border for a low-light instructor, for sure, maybe um, a pistol-mounted optics instructor. That's down in Bisbee um, on the border. Back to gun site for the first advanced uh, pistol mounted optics class out here we're going to do. And then I'll be sticking around for a revolver roundup. December, we'll see me at Mead Hall for a hybrid pistol mounted optics instructor one. That's the one for decent normal human beings and cops. It's not just limited. Change the, uh, the prerequisites for that. So as long as you have 40 hours of instructor, firearms instructor development training, and you can send me a lesson plan that I can look at just 
to confirm that because that class does not go into teaching lesson plans, teaching instructor liability and stuff. So I want folks to have that before we go down the road. Uh, that's that's right now it through the end of the year. Um, anybody who's interested in, in hosting me for classes next year, please reach out so we can get those on calendar. Right, probably the sooner the better, just the way everything's going. But I understand right now for a lot of folks, things are things are up in the air with the economy and yeah. other things. But if you want to uh, talk about next year and get on the calendar and lock in some dates, please reach out. All right, on October the twentieth, I will finally, in like thirteen months, as I have had a class. Uh, October the 20th at Red Hill Range in Martin, Georgia, I will be teaching trigger management, which is by far my best selling uh, class of anything that I do. Uh, I think four tickets in that class have sold. Um, so I'm hoping to get a few more in there. Uh, I've got a, a bill to pay for the business that I've got to generate some revenue uh, to pay for that. So I can stay in business for this coming next year. Uh, finally, I hope I am through. Also, I've got I've had the hand surgery, I've had both eye surgeries, Hopefully I'm on the backside of all of that medically and can get back to teaching. I finished the graduate program. I've got a lot of stuff that I want to be, be implementing. And so hopefully, you know, as 2025 rolls around, I will be able to be offering a lot more stuff than I have over the last year. Uh, it's going to mostly be in the Southeast though, just because I've decided I'm not going to be using all of my, my leave anymore to, I'm not going to take every day off to go work another job. Right. Uh, let's just make sense. Space that. I will still travel within reason uh, for full classes. So if somebody wants to do uh, get together where we pre sell a bunch of stuff and you know get stuff done, uh, that well, that's fun. We can that? talk about their cognitive conclave. I still get asked about when we're going to do the second. Uh, one. Her, Hearn uh, called me yesterday and brought up a cognitive conclave. So uh, I'll talk with you after we get off the air. Uh, we may have to come back to Georgia for that this this time. Okay. So I can make sure I'm working in my schedule. Um, uh, yeah, I'm approaching my one year anniversary with the new job. So I have bank every day of leave, uh, so far with the new job. Uh, I've also amassed a considerable amount of comp time. So this coming year, I should be able to take some time off. It's just got to fit in with the teaching schedule of everything that, that's going on. Uh, and we have massive, uh, people, uh, coming with some of the teaching stuff to do some new state mandates that, that have rolled down the pipe. So that's another reason, another complication that's going to be able to keep me just saying, yeah, I'll show up out there in Texas or Colorado or wherever to teach a class. Uh, I just don't have the freedom to roam out the country like I used to. Well, so since you don't, you can have them contact me and I'll go to Texas and Colorado. <laughs> there you go. And uh, that's Eric at Cougar Mountain Solutions. <laughs> so, um, I do have the Range Master Reunion coming up in November. Uh, the only thing I've got on the books for 2025 right now is TACCON. Uh, I'll probably work with Eric and John and uh, the other John about setting up a cognitive conclave. And then after that, I'll pick some other dates to teach some classes. So just be watching my calendar. Um, I, I know I've gotten some people sent me some questions and stuff over the last several weeks. I just have not had a chance to respond uh, for, for one. Yeah eye patches and eye drops and, and everything else too. So, but I'll get caught up in all that coming up. Uh, Eric, anything else you want to say in closing? No, just thanks for your time, folks. Appreciate it. Thanks yeah. for having me on. Uh, Eric, thank you for, uh, for signing in and playing tonight. Hearn left us hanging and uh, we always got to get Hearn. Who? Yeah. That guy. Ooh. Yeah. So it, it never hurts to get a good Herning in. Um, so that, that's the downside of not being able to produce episodes here recently on a regular basis. Is I've got all this herning building up inside of me and I got to get it out. Uh, to the audience, we understand that your most important asset is your time. Thank you for choosing to spend it with us. <laughs>